Hello, Thomas. Can you hear me? Sorry, you are muted. I, I really don't know. Right, right. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. Great. It looks, looks it's working as it should. Very good. Oh. Yeah. So I'm, I, in the end, I, I just uh, <clears throat> went to the office because right. the internet in the flat is just uh, unpredictable and uh, it goes off now and then. Yeah. So when you are in the office, is the internet connection stable and? Absolutely. It's, it's very good. It's, a, it's an institute with one study at Stellenbosch. So the infrastructure here is just perfect. You know, uh, in South Africa, there are occasional power cuts, which are called load shedding. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, basically, you know in advance when you might have it because they send out, you know, ESCOM, the electricity provider sends out the list. But whenever we have load shedding here, we have a generator. So it just, the, the power is only gone for a few seconds and then it comes back. All right, that's convenient. Yeah. yeah. So tell me about your, uh, your seminar. I mean, you, you have occasional meetings with, other, with students? Yeah, so our, our whole society uh, is basically running on like mostly weekly basis. So we are having uh, these kind of talks with uh, mostly with like, archaeology professors, but also like people who are doing anthropology or who are like beyond the uh, mm -hmm. archaeology field. And uh, yeah, undergraduate, graduate students, sometimes even like people who are just interested in archaeology uh, mm -hmm. are joining us, sometimes from all over the world. So we are kind of open to, to anyone. Fantastic. So how many do you get participants on an average? So approximately it, it's about 20, 25 participants mm -hmm. uh, per, per one talk, but it really varies like how, how are people interested? Like yeah, I, yeah. I think our maximum was about 40, 45, something, something like that. Or, yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, excellent. And and where are you yourself in your in your studies? Uh, so, uh, I'm I'm second year at, at the okay. moment. I, I'm undergraduate student, archaeology and anthropology. At, right. at yeah. Um. What, what is your research on in in South Africa? What are you What are you doing yeah, there currently? I'm not actually. I'm not mainly carrying out research in South Africa, although I'm gathering a bit of material. It's not, I'm not here on fieldwork. I'm here as a fellow at this Institute of Advanced Study. All right. So I'm here for three months, uh, got a fellowship, uh, an invitation to just spend a few months here. And it's a wonderful place because it's extremely interdisciplinary. You know, you have people from theoretical physics, from theology, from all over the place. Um, who spend anything between six weeks and the, and the semester at the, uh, at the Institute. So it's uh, for those of us who have uh, interdisciplinary interests, it's, uh, it's very stimulating. You know, you get to know research from entirely different fields. There have been archaeologists here too, but I don't think there are any at the moment. But uh, I know there have been some. So, uh, so I'm writing about, I'm working on uh, globalization and diversity where the uh, assumption is that globalization inherently leads to a reduction in both biodiversity and cultural diversity, because it's standardizing, it's homogenizing. I mean, it has a lot of flattening, um, I mean, flattening characteristics. Uh, and so I'm trying to look at bio and cultural diversity through, through the same theoretical lens, trying to analyze them together. And uh, I'm hoping to, uh, to be surprised as I go along. So that, I mean, uh, you know, the, the main hypothesis is that, there, yes, there is a reduction in cultural diversity and biodiversity, but maybe things are not as simple as they may seem. 
So, uh, so that's the, but what I'm going to talk about today, I mean, as we uh, emailed about is really uh, the Anthropocene, which is also, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a framework for, for my research as well, but the Anthropocene as a concept, and you might say as a game changer in, in this human sciences, it's, uh, I don't know about undergraduate archaeology, but it seems as if questions to do with climate, the environment, culture, nature are coming in in a big way into all the humanities and social sciences now. And it's happened in just a couple of decades. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. Also, like the, the whole narrative of Anthropocene as, as it is, is kind of interesting one. Yes. Actually, in, in, in the last decades, and well, even the question of if it's really a, a thing or if we should define the, the era in which we live nowadays as, as Anthropocene or, or not. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I'm I'm going to I'm going to defend the concept of Anthropocene during my talk, and then uh, feel free to disagree. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but the frame, but the framework. I mean, the the, the time timing. Uh, I speak for about forty five minutes, and then we have some Q and A. Yeah, that's kind of usual concept. We have like if if it's going to be a bit longer, like fifty. 55 minutes that yeah, yeah. shouldn't be a problem but yeah that's about the uh, the time space we have there and and then a mm -hmm. couple of questions afterwards that's great yeah that's lovely yeah so just out of interest like as, as you are norwegian uh <laughs> you is this also a thing that kind of inspired you to to, to study globalization and and diversity because like at least from my perspective and, and correct me if i'm wrong here but uh I, I i feel like norway is quite uh closed in in terms of like uh immigration of like mm -hmm. uh accepting kind of you know foreigners and, and and really like uh getting them into making out of them a full citizens of, of uh, Norway. Yeah. So, so I was just wondering whether this was yeah. some kind of aspect as well, why you well, um, Yeah, well, I mean, in a way, uh, I'm not sure if it's Norway as such, but, you know, the debate about cultural diversity has been sort of very active, very vibrant, and especially in Western Europe, in, in, in the context of migration. So a colleague of mine, well, a friend of mine, actually, Steve Ertebeck, who is an anthropologist, coined the term super diversity some years ago because he's, he argued that the diversity has diversified. There's more of everything now in, in big cities. So uh, they become far more diverse. And I'm not sure if it's true. OK, that's one of the uh, questions I'm raising in my in my research. I mean, I've been looking at that sort of thing in Oslo as well, with directing research on, on migration into Norway. Are we getting more diverse, or is everybody trying to be diverse in pretty much the same ways? You know, that's the logic of identity politics. But we can discuss that as well. I'm not sure. No, I don't think Norway has anything to do with this as such. Where are you from originally? Oh, I'm from Slovakia. Right, yeah. Yeah, which has much fewer immigrants. Yeah, far fewer yeah. immigrants and a very different history. I know, I, I know people in Slovakia. You know, I was in Bratislava just, uh, just before the lockdown, actually, just before the pandemic. Yeah. How so? Yeah, well, there was, a, there was a kind of literary festival or a cultural festival, and one of my books had been translated into Slovak, so I was there, you know, to talk about the book and, you know, to meet people, and uh, there were people from several Central European countries, from Hungary, Poland, it was a rather sort of international, uh, not very nice event in, in Bratislava. Yeah. Do you remember what was the name of the festival? Just out of curiosity. I can't remember what, what it was called. I'm sorry. No. No worries. No worries. Uh, it was called something in Slovak. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but it was good. Yeah. Bratislava, beautiful city. And much more laid back than either Vienna or Prague. Uh, Would you say so? More laid back, more relaxed. Yeah. And for how long uh, do you plan to stay in South Africa? Uh, I'm here until Easter. So um, another, a little more than two months. I mean, I've been there for a month and then another two months. Yeah. Is this whole project based on some cooperation between Oslo University and uh, that institute in, in South Africa? Not really, no. I mean, I, I applied you know, for, the, for the fellowship individually and there's no, there's no link. 
and mm. we have people here from basically all around the world you know quite a few americans and uh, the couple of people from israel uh, it's very it's very diverse and also some people from african universities who are grants here so it's um, you get to meet people whom you otherwise would never talk with are you still teaching at a university oh, yeah oh, yeah but I'm on sabbatical now. That's why I can be here. Otherwise, it would have been impossible. <laughs> so I teach a few courses in uh, in anthropology at home. I've got one on digital anthropology, which we, which is coming up, which I, which suddenly has has gained a new kind of relevance owing to the pandemic. You know, I started this digital anthropology thing a few years ago, and suddenly everybody went. I mean, everything we did migrated to to the uh, online space. Like the seminar we're having now, for example, it's become a sort of a normal thing to communicate via mm. Zoom. Yeah. And it creates lots of, I mean, the pandemic has also produced a lot of challenges for people who are depending, uh, depending on doing fieldwork because you, you couldn't. And that's for anthropologists, not being able to do fieldwork is quite serious. So we have to find inventive solutions. So have you done some some field work over like Zoom yeah. or not video? the same thing? It can be done, and we had we had to do it, but it's not the same thing. You know, you don't get the smell of places. You don't really you can't make observations. You can only make interviews. I mean, there are lots of limitations. Definitely. But uh, but things are hopefully going back to normal now. So um, so we'll see. Let me just see. I'm using some technology in this talk. Let's, let me just check if it works. Can you see no. some text? You can see the text. Yes. No. Yeah. Is, is this the way you are going to be presenting? Or yes, I'm going to use this technology. Yeah. All right. Can you read it? Really? Uh, yeah, I will just spotlight you for everyone. And now, yeah, everyone should see you on a, on a big screen. Okay. So, okay. yeah, because some of us are meeting also in person in, in one of the buildings at, at Oxford. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this is truly a hybrid uh, yeah. meeting. And some may be, I don't know, some may be watching it on their smartphones, in which case the text is going to be very small, but it's not essential. And I have some pictures as well, which will be easier to see. So, um, yeah. Good. Um, so when you when you teach, do you teach mostly undergraduates or graduates? Yeah, every every level. I mean, I, I do everything. Everything from the you know, first year to to the PhD. I've um, I've been around for a long time. I, I've been working in the same place since the late nineteen eighties, with a few breaks, but I've always returned, you know, to the uh, to the department. <laughs> mm. So uh, yeah. I mean, that's probably also the way how one can get a very deep kind of connection with with all the people who are working around them, very kind of specific experience so. with, with the academics around them. Yeah, but you know, one of the things that we we share between Slovakia and Norway is that we are fairly small populations and a bit on the outskirts of Europe. So there's a real need for us to communicate with others. We have to learn languages and travel and be curious. Whereas if you're American, uh, you don't really have to do that because it's, you, you live in a much larger country. So in a way, this is a privilege to, to come from a small country because it forces you to, uh, to be open-minded. At least on a good day. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. So you just tell me when when we should start. It's a bit after eight now, six in England, eight in South Africa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think we are good to start because there we we gave a couple of minutes to some latecomers, and if someone will want to, they they will join a bit later. Oh, excuse me. Uh, right. So I, I I think we we are good to start. Uh, yeah. Uh, Welcome everyone to another of our talks of, of, of delivery term. Uh, we are very glad that you are joining us also on the <laughs> it's kind of special uh, day of uh, St. Valentine's Day. Uh, 
but I, uh, I, I believe that the topic of, of today's talk is going to uh, touch upon at least slightly on, uh, on St. Valentine's Day, uh, yeah. at least a bit. And our today's guest speaker is, is Thomas Highland Erickson, uh, Professor of Social Anthropology at the University of Oslo, uh, and who specializes uh, mostly on uh, like uh, na nationalism, uh, ethnic borders, and, and uh, globalism. And for many of us, especially anthropology students, is kind of a, a hero in a, in, in a sense that he's also author of uh, uh, kind of textbooks and, and, and especially book of uh, small places, large issues. Uh, thanks to which we've been, or many of us have been introduced to the world of anthropology and, and to many, to many uh, basic or like essential terms of, of anthropology. So without uh, any further delay, I'm leaving this virtual stage to you, Thomas. Thanks very much, Jacob, and uh, thanks for the uh, invitation. I mean, I must confess, had I known when we agreed on the date that this was Valentine's Day, I might have, you know, suggested a different date, okay? Uh, but I'll get back to my, my long-suffering wife when we're finished here. So um, the topic of my talk today is really going to be about something that can be described almost as an intellectual revolution in the humanities and social sciences. Only since the turn of the century, there has been a perceptible shift in the focus uh, of uh, much of what we do. Uh, and I can only speak for myself for, for many years. Uh, I studied globalization, but from the perspective of cultural and political identity, I was interested, in, as Jacob says, said in his introduction, I was interested in the politics of identity, both the politics of identity from below, you know, rights movements, minority movements, uh, ethnic relations, but also identity politics from above, nationalism, you know, standardization, uh, the sort of the way in which people are forced to become citizens in a globalized world. And then <clears throat> in the last at least decade, or perhaps a bit more, um, my interest remains in globalization and local responses to the global, the way in which uh, global processes are being um, perceived and responded to in local communities. So that's because that's basically what anthropologists do. We tend to study uh, local communities, but we have to increasingly do this on the backdrop of global processes. But there's been a shift in my work towards an increased and growing interest in what we could speak of as the Anthropocene family of issues or Anthropocene family of questions. I'm coming back to the concept of the Anthropocene in a little while. Um, of course, it's being discussed, it's, uh, it's a bit controversial, it's contested, and yet it has somehow stuck. If you were to do uh, a web search of the term Anthropocene 20 years ago, well, there would be nothing because the, the term was coined around the year 2000. But if you were to do it in, say, 2010 and today, you would notice a really sort of rapid growth in the use of the term Anthropocene, which has also increasingly entered the everyday language. So, so I believe that the uh, attention to Anthropocene effects, that is to say, the impact of humanity on the planet as a geological phenomenon, you know, Anthropocene is a geological concept, it's not a cultural uh, or social science uh, concept. Uh, this, the, this impact is so momentous uh, that it is uh, shifting the focus of the uh, the, not only the natural sciences, but also the social sciences and, and humanities. It can be described as at least the most significant game changer since, you know, the introduction of theoretical Marxism in the late 1960s and 70s, which changed the way people understood history and, uh, and social relations in fairly fundamental ways, or post-colonialism in the 1990s. Where, um, or 80s and 90s, after the publication of Edward Said's book Orientalism in 1978, which also led to a shift in the way in which we described other people. Describing other people suddenly became a big problem, not least to anthropologists. How can you talk about other people or peoples 
um, without transgressing some norms and without being a, a, a neo-colonial uh, representative of a particular gaze, right? And this is also with us, the post-colonial and the decolonial still with us. But uh, yeah, Anthropocene can be compared to those, uh, but I would argue that it may be of more lasting importance because Anthropocene effects are not going away. And I'm going to run you through some of those Anthropocene effects in a little while, but first, let us reflect on, uh, let me, or let me rather invite you to reflect with me on the curious absence of nature in mainstream 20th century anthropology. Nature was almost absent from mainstream, not from all. There were always, <clears throat> excuse me, environmental anthropologists, there were always uh, anthropologists who had a, 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 a genuine and deep interest in ecology, but they were a minority. They were marginal, they were not central to the discipline. If we take the founding fathers of 20th century social and cultural anthropology, they disagreed about lots of things, but they did agree that the focus of anthropology should be on social relations and cultural meaning, that is to say, humanities. Anthropos, it's about anthropos, right? It's about humanity. Or if you belong to a humanities discipline, as archaeologists sometimes do. I mean, at my university, archaeology is part of the uh, humanities faculty. Uh, the humanities, quite clearly about human affairs, the social sciences, it's about social relationships between people. And then there is something outside these people, okay, the animals, plants, and weather, and that kind of thing. But it's only interesting in so far as, as it affects and has a significance for human social relations. So, I mean, uh, in the early history of 20th century anthropology, um, the great uh, theorists of uh, British and uh, American anthropology, Radcliffe Brown, Malinowski, and in France, uh, Marcel Mauss, in the United States, Franz Boas, uh, they had fairly different approaches to um, social life. I mean, Malinowski, individual functionalism, you know, institutions exist in order to satisfy individual needs. Radcliffe Brown, no, it's the other way around. Individuals exist in order to uh, maintain institutions. Marcel Mauss, with his Durkheimian view of uh, social life, was concerned with personhood. What is it that produces a social person? And, and how do social persons differ from culture to culture? His most famous text on, on the gift, on reciprocity, the glue that ties people together, that binds, that makes societies coherent in the absence of, of a centralized state. So very different questions asked. And Franz Boas and his uh, American School of Cultural Anthropology, which was really, you could, you could say, I mean, almost that it was a German Geisteswissenschaft. I mean, a German uh, humanities uh, discipline transposed to the United States. Many of the early American anthropologists were German immigrants, like Boas himself. So they had a concern with meanings, with symbols, with culture in the broad sense. So they disagreed about lots of things, but they agreed that nature or um, the role of nature, ecology, etc., is marginal to our endeavor. They were, they were critical of Malthusianism, you know, Malthus, the idea that um, population growth will lead to um, certain severe unintended consequences because the growth in um, production is not capable of keeping up with population growth. No environmental determinism. The idea that, you know, people um, in various parts of the world, they have the culture and the way of life they do because of uh, certain aspects of their environment. They were quite hostile to this kind of reductionist, simplistic explanations. And certainly um, early to mid uh, 20th century anthropology, both in Europe and in the United States, were really concerned with positioning themselves as different from Darwinian um, biological uh, explanations. So there was a, I wouldn't say a hostility, but a rather strong indifference towards ecology and nature in, uh, in, in mainstream 20th century anthropology. And this is why it is so significant that the discipline has changed 
so quickly. And it's changing, in fact, as I'm, as I'm sitting here, it's, it's continuing. I, I mean, I just picked up a book yesterday in a bookshop outside of Cape Town. It looks like this, okay? Rock, Water, Life, Ecology and Humanities for a Decolonial South Africa by Leslie Green. A wonderful book about the way in which we engage with, uh, with, uh, with nature and the way in which we are part of nature, just as a typical example of the kind of book that anthropologists write today. So there have been many recent efforts to decenter humanity and to write humanity into a broader environmental uh, framework. We see this in history, in uh, I mean the um, incipient discipline of environmental history, which is also growing, um, and it's no longer as marginal as it was in the 1980s. Let me just give you one example from from history. Okay, A book published in 1972 uh, called *The Columbian Exchange* by Alfred Crosby, which is about the way in which the interchange of foodstuffs, of plants, of animals, and certainly of people and ideas following the European uh, colonial conquests, starting with Columbus. That's why he calls it the Colombian exchange, how, the, how these processes have shaped the world. How, for example, the fact that uh, the staple in uh, Southern Africa, uh, the, the staple sort of source of carbohydrates and energy is maize, corn. Is space quite recent. I mean, it was introduced on a big scale only in the 19th century, and it's American. Right? And we could go on. And the point is that Crosby's book, when it was first published in 1972, wasn't very popular. You know, many felt that he, he doesn't understand power, he doesn't understand contradiction. There's an environmental determinism there. But this perspective has grown in relevance slowly but steadily in the last few decades, just as an example of the fact that uh, the material processes, the material exchanges between society and nature and the role of nature as such have, uh, have increased in, in significance in our disciplines. So uh, we have many uh, efforts now within the discipline of anthropology to uh, do something serious about the nature culture contrast. You know, Levi Strauss famously said that every culture, every society has a distinction, a contrast between culture and nature, that which is human and that which is not. And this is one of the fundamental binaries in human society. Now, this view has been challenged time and time again by later anthropologists. Some of them students of Levi Strauss have shown that it's more complicated than that. There are peoples in the Amazon, uh, in uh, the Andes, um, in the Himalayas and elsewhere, who do not draw a sharp boundary between everything human and everything which is not human. So uh, the, 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 the nature culture um, contrast is being now challenged in, uh, in both old and new ways. And these challenges are now entering the center stage of much of social theory. Uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's quite, I mean, it's, it's easy to understand why. Um, it is to do with the facts of climate change, of environmental destruction, of the way in which we are somehow, as a global civilization, undermining the conditions of our own existence. You know, we are digging our own grave. Uh, we're painting ourselves into a corner. Um, uh, and there seems to be no easy way out. So this is, this, is, this is clearly the explanation for why there is such a heightened interest in these questions to do with culture, nature, and to do with the, the way in which humanity is shaping and also um, destroying um, much of the biodiversity and the uh, uh, ecosphere in, in the world. So in other words, easy to understand this increased interest which has been massive. Uh, as late as uh, 2005, there were just a handful of panels at the American Anthropological Association's annual meeting, uh, which dealt with climate. 10 years later, there were dozens, okay? So it's, it's, it's very easy to, uh, to see that there has been a shift in the emphasis, in the focus, not of everything, not of things that, I mean, everybody doesn't do this, okay? There are still people who do perfectly respectable and interesting work on other issues. 
but climate somehow enters into it. Uh, this book that I mentioned, it, it uh, relates climate and our environmental change to colonialism, to race, to the racialization of nature, for example. So even if you're interested in race politics in South Africa, uh, the Anthropocene effects somehow enter into the analysis and sometimes in a, in a rather dominant way, as in, in the book I showed you. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, so the term Anthropocene, to which I will return in a little while, uh, is becoming a common denominator to many of the uh, attempts that people make uh, to understand the contemporary world. And it is not, again, I mean, this, this is not coincidental. There are very clear, very obvious reasons for it. People who are um, not too uh, impressed by the term Anthropocene have proposed alternative terms for the sake of precision and better focus. So the capital of the scene uh, has been, has been uh, proposed, where it has been pointed out that in fact the destruction that we are seeing, the environmental destruction leading to climate change and irreparable damage. It's not humanity as such, which is to blame, but a particular version of humanity, namely that of predatory neoliberal, increasingly global capitalism, um, with, with its commitment to growth, with its commitment to expansion and domination, uh, etc. So Capitalocene is one alternative to Anthropocene. Another alternative is the Homogenocene, um, which I rather like. I think it, it also identifies an aspect of uh, the present world, which dovetails quite nicely, by the way, uh, and expands on earlier theories of modernity and of nationalism. Because um, uh, the theory of nationalism uh, uh, emphasizes the way in which nation building contributes to erasing certain cultural differences. It is what the great uh, theorist of nationalism, Ernest Gellner, spoke of as social entropy, you know, the obliteration of difference. Is using entropy in a very loose way, okay? Um, obliteration of social and cultural differences so that people can gradually come to see themselves not just as people, but as a people, as citizens of the same state with loyalty to something abstract. As in Benedict Anderson's famous book, Imagined Communities, you know, which could have been, he could have called the book Abstract Communities. He would have been less misunderstood had he done so. Uh, but as he told me when I asked him who would then have bought the book, and, and he was right. Imagine Communities is such a beautiful title for a book, so evocative and poetic and true, because we have to use our imagination for this abstract community to exist. And in order for us to identify with people whom we will never meet, we have to feel that we have something in common. In other words, there has to be a, a, a common grammar established for the expression of identity. So that's the homogenous scene and uh, transposed to a global canvas. Well, you know, the guy who introduced homogenous scene was actually a science journalist, a rather good one called Charles Mann in a book called 1493, which expands on Alfred Crosby's uh, Columbian exchange analysis uh, uh, by, by including more examples and updating the analysis and uh, and enriching it in, in, in various ways. And uh, to, uh, to man, one of the first facts about globalization is homogenization. It standardizes, it homogenizes, uh, it removes difference. Did you know, uh, you probably didn't, <laughs> I just found out myself, okay? Um, of the 350,000 plants which have been identified by scientists, 7,000 have been used as foodstuff, foodstuffs for people uh, at one point or other in history, 7,000 different plants. But at the moment, something like 75% of the food eaten by humanity is composed of just 12 species of plants and five animal species. So you see homogenization, standardization, um, and uh, the homogenocene is a close relative to the term plantation scene, which is another alternative to the Anthropocene. The plantation scene, think about it. 
you have a rainforest. Um, not two trees next to each other belong to the same species. There's an enormous diversity, an enormous variation. And also uh, the undergrowth, uh, the insects, the birds, the snakes, uh, the uh, fungal networks that connect the trees. All of this is uh, incredibly diverse. There are so many species in, uh, in a patch of rainforest. Okay, now you know what I'm going to say. You cut down the rainforest and you replace it with a plantation with, uh, with identical trees standing like uh, so many soldiers, you know, in a, in a, in a military formation, um, all of them the same. So there's been an enormous reduction in, you might say, communication, in information, in internal diversity uh, within this, uh, this area. So the plantation you've seen can be used as a metaphor for talking not only about plantations, which are spreading, but about the spread of, well, McDonald's restaurants. You know, there was a rather nice book by the American sociologist George Witzer called The McDonaldization of Society which has been published in several editions. It's a very popular book in sociology and everybody should read it. It's a fun book and it's also very enlightening because Ritzer uses McDonald's restaurants um, as a way of talking about Max Weber's uh, theory about rationalization and bureaucracy. So he, he, he tries sort of to uh, attract the, uh, the attention, okay, of young students like yourself. <laughs> Everybody's been to McDonald's or they know about McDonald's. So let's start there. McDonald's is it's, it's simplified, it's, uh, it's sort of low threshold, it's standardized, and it's the same all over the world, and it's spreading. So his view is that the logic of McDonald's is, is, is spreading and is reducing diversity in the world. This can be argued against, it can be discussed, but uh, it is an interesting uh, perspective, isn't it? And it's related to the concept of the plantation of sin. So here we have a few ways of trying to elaborate or to uh, be more precise uh, about uh, what is going on in this world of ours, which is now so uh, challenged by the threat of, and indeed the presence of climate change. I mean, look, I'm here in Stellenbosch in South Africa. Today we have 38 degrees. I mean, uh, they may have had 38 degrees before, but it's not common. So um, extreme weather events, we are, I mean, the climate change is not something which is way off in the future, it's happening, uh, it's, it's taking place now. So um, in, in this world of climate change, environmental destruction, the loss of diversity, species extinction, and, uh, and homogenization, there are several uh, ways of trying to frame it. But the point is that lots of social scientists and humanities scholars are now busy at work trying to talk about this in an enlightening way, which we didn't when I was a student. I mean, I was a student in anthropology in the 1980s. Nobody spoke about ecology or nature. Well, maybe one or two mentioned it, but it was not a big thing. And now it is somehow, it is seeping into the very sort of fabric of our bodies and what we're doing as, as intellectuals. Okay, so um, let's move quickly on to arguing for the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene being the era of humanity, the era where human ecological footprint is such that it can be perceived everywhere in the world, even where no human being has set foot, like Antarctica or the deep recesses of the Amazon forest. Owing to climate change and, and air pollution, uh, the human footprint is visible, it's perceptible. So uh, uh, Paul Crutzen, the middle name here in these three authors of, of, of a rather important article called The Anthropocene from 2007. He was one of the people who, along with Eugene Stormer, um, coined the term around the year 2000. And Crutzen is an uh, atmospheric chemist. So he's not, a, he's not a humanities scholar. Now the Great Acceleration, which is also the title of a book uh, by, uh, by John McNeil and Peter Engelke, is about the way in which uh, um, human impact on the world have, uh, has accelerated dramatically since the Second World War. And you can see, you know, all of these growth curves, which point quite steeply upwards. 
And the many other things could have been added, but you can see here anything from the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, um, shrimp aquaculture, very, very steep. You could have taken the wheat in aquaculture as well, farmed salmon, which has grown phenomenally, or paper production, water use. Do they have tourism? Yes, they have tourism, which is one of my favorite examples. I mean, how tourism has increased by, by a factor of, uh, of six or seven since the year 1980, in just 40 years, up to 2019. Now, 2020 and 21 have been special years in many respects. So let's just bracket those years for now. For moments, let's not talk about the pandemic, which has been very interesting seen from this perspective, because it has somehow led to a at least temporary reversal of some of these tendencies. An overheated, accelerated world was forced to slow down. So um, let me say a few more things about the Anthropocene, apart from the uh, physical sort of footprint, the ecological footprint on the planet. We have a culture addicted to speed. And the thing about speed, when you've, when you've got it, you can never get too much. You can never get enough. When speed is what makes somehow uh, society and progress and uh, innovation meaningful, you can't get enough of it. The 5G networks are being rolled out now uh, in many countries, not without a certain resistance. The whole point about 5G is that it's faster than 4G. That's a, that's a selling argument. You, or we can, yeah, yeah, we can we can talk about many other things, but I don't have time to do that. But let me just say that, okay, you have 5G, but the, the sort of the logic behind 5G is also parallel in the... Uh, building of infrastructure such as highways. The only reason why they have to destroy wetlands to build a highway is for traffic to move faster because they save, you know, two minutes, okay, or three minutes and, uh, um, and it's considered an inherently good thing. So, so as, a, as a general principle, if you have a speed addiction, and I'm not talking about speed in the literal sense, okay, um, you can never get enough of it. Um, and um, I think this is one example not mentioned by uh, by um, those pe the people McNeil, Crutzen, and uh, and Stefan. World trade. This is containerization. I think containerization is a very nice image of the homogeneous scene and standardization. All shipping containers are exactly the same dimension. I mean, look at those. The, the bottom two from Esk, the other the, from other suppliers, and they're identical. They fit onto the same railway carriages the same ships, and they can be lifted by the same cranes, by identical standardized ports worldwide. And this is also quite recent, it's happening now, right? Um, the uh, um, containerization um, has, it started to come into the world in the 1960s and it took off in the 1970s and 80s. And uh, the economic miracle of China would have been impossible without containerization, for example. So uh, the shipping container, if I were to just mention two objects that tell us something about the 2020s and the current state of the Anthropocene, I would probably not start by talking about plantations or coal mines, although they are important, but the two main symbols of this time, the shipping container and the smartphone, okay? One object which is very big, another which is very small, and which together symbolize and uh, epitomize the uh, standardization, homogenization, uh, and acceleration that we are currently living through. So, I mean, uh, in January 2007, there were no smartphones in the world of the sort of contemporary kind with the, with the touch screen. Uh, and now we have more than 4 billion. In only 15 years, people are helpless. You know, uh, after this talk, I have to go back to my flat. <laughs> and uh, in, I mean, in South African cities, you, if you're a pale skinned person like me, you don't walk in the dark unless you really have to. So I have to get an Uber. But how to get an Uber? If I had, did not have this, this thing, I wouldn't have been able to. So we become dependent on this technology in a frightfully short time. 
Uh, and it's not just you and me, it's uh, lots of people. We have a lot of fascinating anthropological research about the spread of the smartphone, not least in the so-called global south. So um, smartphones, world trade, speed. Yeah, why not say a few things about waste as well? Plastic waste. Uh, I couldn't find the figures um, as I was preparing this talk, but uh, there's been a very, very steep growth curve only, since, only in the last uh, few years or decades. In the last decade, there's been a, a, you know, an explosive growth in plastic waste. So this, as you can see, is a, an activist from an activist page. The more we use, the more we produce, the more we must extract, the more we have to waste unless we recycle everything, which is probably not going to happen. So, um, so there, is a, there, is, there has been an acceleration of acceleration. And a few years ago, I wrote a book about this connected to a research project called Overheating, the three crises of globalization, uh, where I speak about acceleration, but I also say that, you know, yes, there has been accelerated change since the Second World War, but we have also witnessed an acceleration of acceleration since around 1991, the end of the Cold War. The release of uh, Madiba, Nelson Mandela from prison, from Robben Island, and the beginning of the new South Africa, an open society. The opening up of the Indian economy happened around the same time, a much larger economy, uh, opening up to, to foreign investment and, and market forces. It had been much more centralized before the early 1990s. The coming of the internet, the mobile phone, many things happened. And the, of course, the end of the Cold War as the defining event uh, of, of 1991. So the overheated world in which we live is the world of 1991, uh, right? Um, okay, I think, uh, I'm not sure if I convinced you about the relevance of the concept of the Anthropocene, but maybe I can convince you of the relevance of the concept of overheating. You know, overheating, uh, you know, when you rub your hands together like this, which in Northern Europe, you, you may be inclined to do now and then, now here in South Africa, we don't have to, but you do in order to get warm. If you could do it really fast, your hands would eventually burn up or they would be charred because of the heat generated through the friction. But it doesn't happen because you have an inbuilt thermostat, which tells your hands it's enough, you can stop now, you're warm, uh, there's no need to accelerate further. The danger about global overheating is that we're seeing similar processes of accelerated change in the domains that I mentioned, plus in a number of other areas with no inbuilt thermostats, right? Uh, it's, uh, and this is, this is why it's overheating, because it's, uh, there's, there's no instance which can actually turn off the heat. Well, maybe except a pandemic, but it seemed to be a temporary thing, perhaps. Uh, so let's, uh, let's uh, um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm skipping over this, unsustainable. I think, you know, uh, uh, that uh, in many ways, the, the current itinerary or the current trajectory of global capitalism is unsustainable because we, we're using up far more than we produce. We're incurring debt, enormous debt to coming in generations. There's an annual day called Overshoot Day, which many of you would have heard about, Overshoot day is the day every year when we have used, as it were, the available resources we have. And uh, overshoot day, before the pandemic, it came sort of a little bit earlier every year. So I think in 2019, overshoot day was in late July. That's when we had used up somehow what we had at our disposal. Uh, and, um, and the rest of the year, we, uh, we were incurring debt to, to the, the coming generations. So this is where we are. And this is where many anthropologists position their work. This image is from, uh, from the Niger Delta in Southeast Nigeria, where the, the water is poisoned, the soil is poisoned, vegetation is dying. And the uh, people who live there, they used to be farmers and fishermen, but it's, it's also the center of the Nigerian highly profitable and incredibly important oil industry. Okay, so this is where we are. And uh, this is part of the story of why we are witnessing this shift towards an increased attention to um, uh, environmental uh, uh, questions in, in the social and human sciences. 
simply because there's an urgency and it affects people everywhere. Um, it's just like, I mean, globalization in general. You cannot travel anywhere in the world without people being uh, somehow affected by globalization. Go into the New Guinea Highlands and people would have heard about the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, what they've heard is another story, but they have heard about it. They know about it and, uh, and so on. So we're all affected uh, and um, yeah, and, and we, yeah, uh, there are many interconnections so that this young woman who's looking at her damaged ecosystem in Southeast Nigeria, uh, you know, she is connected not only to other living things or dead things around her, but she's also connected to us who uh, are children of coal and children of the oil. Now, let me move on quickly because I have to, I'm going to end up with a bit of archaeology and a bit of anthropology. Uh, so um, in order to understand the contemporary world, it's not enough to look at representations and social relations. We have to understand the material underpinnings of society. And uh, I recommend everybody to have a look at one of Václav Smil's book, books. Doesn't have to be this one, uh, but uh, not any of his books, but he's written many books about energy and this may be the most important one. Uh, for a long time, social anthropologists were wary to talk about energy. They, they didn't like it. They felt that just as with environmental determinism, Malthusianism, there is a determinism when you, when you speak about energy as, a, as an important factor in society. But I think uh, in this day and age, it's inevitable. It is, it is so crucial. And in this book, uh, Energy and Civilization, uh, Smeal rather skillfully moves up and down the scales and back and forth in history. So he can tell you, for example, why a horse is much more valuable than a donkey, because it produces at least five times as many watts. Uh, you know, um, and, um, and it's also necessary to understand the dependence, the current dependence on energy, not just on speed, but on energy, on high, uh, high energy production and consumption in the kind of world in which we live, uh, in order to understand a couple of things. One of them is the loss of flexibility. We've lost flexibility. We cannot just shift back, as it were, to a more sustainable way of life, because there's 8 billion of us. And we depend, I mean, uh, many of us live in societies where we're totally dependent on high energy use. Um, but it's also important to, um, to understand energy in order to um, understand how societies work. So one concept uh, which is central to Sneel is uh, Eroy. Okay, I'll put it down here. Just a moment, I'll see if I can manage to add something. Uh, yes, Eroy. Uh, it stands for energy returns on investment. If the euro is zero, you might as well stay at home. I mean, there's no, there's no point in exploiting the energy because uh, the amount of energy you use just to get the resources out of the ground uh, are identical to the amount of energy you get out of the ground. Uh, and uh, uh, on the whole, euro uh, declines on the whole. It has increased, but it, in the long term, it will, it will decline. So the lower limit is reached, in other words, when you use as much energy to get the energy as what you get in return. Right. So, um, but uh, why is transitioning to a low energy society unlikely and unrealistic? I mean, okay, take a country like the United States. Without fossil fuels, the United States would have needed twice its existing agricultural land just to feed the horses in order to produce enough food for its current population, because you would have need that, needed that many horses. Of course, this is absurd, it's impossible, and it, and it wouldn't have worked. But it's just an example. Productivity, owing to the, the, the availability of accessible, inexpensive, uh, compact energy, initially in the shape of coal, eventually in the shape of, uh, of oil and gas, uh, has led to, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's been the uh, a, a major cause of the uh, kind of social uh, complexity in which we live today. And it, there's, no, there's no turning back from a high energy society. At the moment, there's 8 billion of us, as I say, and we all need something to eat. In the 19th century, productivity in American agriculture grew by a factor of seven. So it was, uh, I mean, uh, the productivity, not just the production, but the productivity. 
each hectare produced seven times more by the end of the 19th century, owing to mechanization and to uh, improved fertilizers and, and, and so on. So um, what I wanted to say with this is that we need to understand energy and the significance of energy, and there's no easy way out. Okay, there's no simple solution. There's no cheap fix to the to the Anthropocene dilemmas. Now, finally, a little bit about archaeology. This book is a favorite of mine. I don't know if you've come across it. Uh, the Collapse of Complex Societies by Joseph Tainter from uh, from 1988. So it's not it's not new, but um, the analysis seems to be quite valid because the, most of its examples. I mean, the examples are mainly. Uh, classic ones, the Mayans, the Roman Empire, etc. And he's produced these analyses of the causes of civilization collapse in the past. This perspective was popularized uh, by Jerry Diamond uh, a few years later in his book called Collapse. But what, what Tainter shows, among other things, is what contemporary societies, what we can learn from archaeological research when we are faced with crises. So, uh, so in his comments on the present, not in that book, well, he touches upon it, but he's written stuff later where he deals with the contemporary situation relating it to the Maya, to the uh, Romans, etc. So in his comments on the present, climate change comes across as just one factor in accounting for the decline of complex societies. And he says, and this is why I mentioned Eroy when I spoke about Smeal, uh, returns on investment in energy. Uh, energy returns on investment. Uh, and he says that uh, the decisive cause of the eventual collapse of our complex societies uh, will be a result of uh, margin, re decreased marginal returns on investments in energy, owing to population growth and subsequent intensification of food production with decreasing returns, coupled with growth in bureaucratic, logistic and transport costs. Now this is a, this was a long, uh, I mean, a convoluted sentence. Okay, but read uh, read Tainter, and you'll find out, for example, why cities can only grow so much in antiquity, because they needed to get energy in the shape of food and labor from outside. And the larger a city became, the further away were the sources of its sustenance. After the fossil fuel revolution, this has not been a problem. Nowadays, I mean, you can have a city of thirty million, and it can still thrive. So um, so don't tell me that. Uh, uh, energy is um, is insignificant. So coal, we can see now, and its close relatives, gas and, and oil, was the salvation of humanity for two centuries, and it has led to the uh, ability to support the kind of global population and complexity we have today. But it is now quickly becoming our damnation because it contributes to destroying the ecology of the planet and uh, leading to climate change. And uh, there's no easy way out. So the lesson from cultural history may nevertheless be, and I think that's that's the valid lesson. And I'm coming back to that in a little while. I'm going to finish quite soon, okay? Uh, but not quite yet. A few more things to say. Uh, maybe the lesson from cultural history and archaeology may be that lean societies, decentralized, flexible, with less bureaucracy than farming, fewer advertising people than fishermen would be the most, most sustainable ones in the long term. How to get there, I can't tell you. But as Tainter remarks towards the end of the book, he says, complex societies are recent in human history. Collapse, then is not a fall to some primordial chaos, but a return to the normal human condition of lower complexity. So, um, there may be, I mean, it, it may well be that the kind of material that you archaeologists and we anthropologists have been analyzing for 100 years may come in quite handy when we begin to think seriously about the possibility of transitioning to a different kind of society, which is sustainable, which doesn't undermine the conditions for its own existence, which doesn't encourage super rich people to travel to other planets because this, this one is going to be uninhabitable. Right, uh, so the kind of knowledge that we produce could, in fact, be, be quite quite crucial. In anthropology, uh, we have lots of knowledge 
about other people's knowledges and other people's ways of dealing with scarcity, with ecology, with their relationship with nature and so on. And this book uh, is a typical one and it's not bad. It's actually very enlightening by Joy Henry, um, Science and Sustainability, Learning from Indigenous Wisdom, where she goes through, I mean, it's part of the anthropological catalog of knowledge about uh, other people's uh, ways of uh, dealing with, uh, with their uh, surroundings, with their environment. And well, how much can we then profitably learn from indigenous peoples, small stateless societies? I would say that, yeah, I mean, when it comes to knowledge, cosmology, yes, there is something which has been lost after Descartes, after the scientific revolution. There is a bond, a uh, sort of integral relationship between humanity and surroundings, which was there and which was lost with the scientific revolution, which translated everything into resources, right? Everything outside of human society became potential resources to the benefit of human societies. And in other cultures, uh, there is more, um, there is more respect. There is, a, there is a greater sense of a great chain of being than in uh, industrial society. So there may be something to learn there. Yet on the other hand, when it comes to social organization, there may not be much that we can pick up from small stateless societies, precisely because you and I are neither small nor stateless, nor do we expect to be so in the, uh, in the near future. So typically in the big family of anthropology, social and cultural, if I can make that distinction just for now, social anthropologists are less enthusiastic about the prospect of learning from indigenous peoples and cultural anthropologists, because cultural anthropologists specialize in the study of meaning and symbols and cosmologies, whereas social anthropologists look at social relationships, economics, politics, law, that kind of thing. That's a classic divide. It's, it's not a divide which is always valid these days, okay? But it's a useful sort of analytical device to see that there are two ways here uh, in which we can relate to um, non, uh, as it were, scientific, non-Occidental knowledges. So culture, cosmology, values, yes. Social organization, politics, probably not. Um, and I'm not going to square the circle for you now, but I just wanted to point this out. Finally, uh, a rather influential book which came out um, before Christmas, The Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity. Well, I mean, I, I mean, they don't have, actually, actually, those authors, at least they don't have problem with their confidence. <laughs> the Dawn of Everything. It's not about the dawn of everything, but it's a book which uh, rewrites uh, the prehistory of humanity, not all of it. I mean, after, basically after the last ice age, okay, the Holocene seeping into the Anthropocene. Um, they don't really write about the Anthropocene at all. They don't, they're not really interested in the environment. They're interested in freedom and choice and options. And uh, what Wengro and Graeber show, I mean, the book is already quite, I mean, it's, it's being debated. Many of the details and many of the stories there are critics who argue that they got a number of things wrong, which is probably correct because it's so wide ranging uh, that it would have been a miracle hadn't, hadn't anything uh, they say in the book been uh, debatable. But uh, uh, one of the sort of take takeaways from the book, which I think are of lasting value, is that the past, as I say here in, the, in, the, in this little text, the past is more diverse than it seems. It's not as if uh, there was a unilinear development from small family-based or kinship-based societies, which gradually became more complex and then they invented agriculture and the first city-states came and then, you know, empires, etc. And then the combustion engine and before you know it, everybody's uh, sitting in a prefabricated house with a mortgage <laughs> or in the shack in a, in a South African township. It's not as simple as that. They say that there's been lots of different forms of social organization in, um, in the distant past. Large, small, egalitarian, hierarchical, 
Uh, even the agricultural revolution was not unilineal. People start trying out a bit of agriculture. They may then have abandoned it and gone back to, to hunting and gathering. And then they started to grow few, some foodstuffs again. There are some unanswered questions in this very rich book, but this is the main point that in fact, uh, the past is quite diverse, which means that we have many options for the future. There is no determinism in history. There is no single direction. So um, I end on this. From Tina, the doctrine, there is no alternative to global neoliberal capitalism. To Tama, there are many alternatives. And I think these are insights uh, that are of scientific academic interest to archaeologists and anthropologists to show this diversity, to uh, militantly uh, attack simplifications that uh, make people intellectually lazy and make them believe in these just so stories that you know you have this sort of linear development. Um, and uh, this will be liberating because it will not only tell us um, that there's far more research to be done on diversity in the past and in the present, but also that we have many options for the future. And I think we're going to need that. We're going to need a lot of imagination, both intellectual and political, if we're going to survive this century in a decent way. So um, I guess I should stop here and uh, I'd be happy to take your, your questions, your disagreements and your, and your comments. And thanks for listening. I'm now turning this off. So. Thank you very much, Thomas, for this talk. It was really an enlightening one. And thank you very much also for ending it with a bit of hope uh, on this rather dark topic. Uh, if anyone would have any questions, just write them down in the chat or uh, raise your hand uh, and, and you can ask it directly. Otherwise, uh, I, will, I will read it out loud. Uh, but to give people some time to form their questions, I will, I will start with uh, one myself. Uh, I got really interested in the concept of, of addiction to speed you have mentioned. So I wanted mm -hmm. to ask, is this something that is kind of applicable generally to, to all societies and, and, and cultures? That Do we see a pattern in which once even like small scale societies are introduced to the concept of a higher speed of, of, mm -hmm. of living or of experience of, of life, do they become kind of addicted to, to this? Mm. Is, is it something that we are prone to do as a, as a humans in general? Mm -hmm. Great question, thank you. Um, well, no, I, 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 I don't think so. You know, I, I, I think that the, this sort of uh, the obsession with speed, efficiency, productivity, etc., that it's, it's about modernity and it's mainly about capitalism. Um, you know, the, the very concept of progress is actually quite recent and localized in, uh, in history. Before the Enlightenment, uh, it was not the common view that somehow that societies developed and that there was a, that change was somehow inherent uh, in society, improvement, change, that kind of thing. It may well be that individuals want to improve their own achievements. You know, you want to become a better hunter. Um, you want to, you know, uh, beat your neighbors in some kind of competition. But uh, uh, no speed as such, I, I associate this very much with modernity and capitalism. Uh, and isn't it interesting, if you, if you think about uh, transport technology, for 2000 years, there was fairly little development. Yes, I mean, there were some improvements. I mean, shipbuilding improved, but still the sailing ship, uh, it was slow. It was just as slow for Magellan as it had been for the Vikings. And were Louis XV to take a trip from Paris to Rome in the early 18th century, it would have taken him about as long as he did for Julius Caesar, nearly 2000 years earlier. And maybe the trip would even have been a bit more comfortable for Julius Caesar because the Romans were famous for the quality of the roads. So the, and then suddenly came the hot air balloon, okay? Suddenly for the first time in human history, you could see Paris from above. 
Can you imagine? It must have been, it must have felt like magic, the hot air balloon. Then came the, uh, the, the steam engine, the train, the steamship, the telegraph. Uh, and then came, you know, uh, towards the end of the 19th century, the pneumatic tubes, the pneumatic tubes, you know, when there were pneumatic tube networks uh, below many major cities that sent these sort of canisters super fast through hy hydraulic uh, force uh, through tunnels from post office to post office or, or to banks and so on. And, uh, and they wanted, the, the only reason that they actually built this infrastructure, which is quite expensive, was that they wanted communication to move faster, you know, the messages to move faster. So, um, so I associate this with, very much with modernity, also because uh, the, the logic of capitalism entails growth, it entails uh, expansion, and if you can produce faster, and you can make people consume faster, you'll earn more money. So it's associated with, I think the obsession we have with speed is, is associated with, with growth, ideas of progress, and our economic system, but by all means, it's also an empirical question, it may well be that there are uh, societies that I haven't thought about. I mean, sports competitions hark back to the ancient Greeks. You know, that the, the, the situs, altius, fortius, you know, faster, higher, stronger motto of the Olympics. You know, we're now in the middle of the Winter Olympics, I hear. Um, the motto of the Winter Olympics go back to ancient Greece. So by all means, there have been competitive treadmills and attempts to, uh, to speed up things in the past as well, but not so much production. You know, traditional societies tended to towards reproduction. I mean, that was the sort of the instinctive mode. But feel free to disagree. But I think right. it's the, the short answer is that it's about modernity. Thank you. Uh, this leads me to another question, which is about definition or uh, like framing of Anthropocene. So. We've, as a humankind, we, we, we've been changing and altering the, the face of, of, of Earth since we, we've evolved, basically. And there are also claims that we've been uh, responsible for uh, extinction of, of uh, uh, great like megafauna at, at different con continents. So for me, the question is also like, how would you frame the, the Anthropocene? Where, when it begins, mm -hmm. um, yeah. like it, it, it obviously continues up until now, but where would you put the last starting line of, of Anthropocene? And I don't know, is it, 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 is it important to know yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. where it starts uh -huh. or, or it's completely irre irrelevant? According to yeah, yeah, great question. Great question. I mean, we, we're, I mean, in this kind of, Scientific culture. I mean, we're obsessed with periodization, aren't we? You know, when something starts. When was the beginning? When did humanity start? And uh, you get a little bit disappointed when you realize that it happened gradually. You can't pinpoint exactly when. Um, with the Anthropocene, yes. I mean, uh, let's not romanticize uh, indigenous as it were, small or medium-sized status groups. They are. They have. I mean, a lot to answer for to, uh, concerning what you mentioned. I mean, the extinction of megafauna. The, uh, the way in which the early migrants uh, to North America, I mean, they basically ate their way down the continent and uh, exterminated many animals on the way. And this has also happened in other parts of the world. So people, I mean, human societies have um, affected a lot of environmental destruction in many parts of the world, but not at the present scale and not at the present speed. So that is something which is new. Some would say that uh, the Anthropocene started in earnest with the first uh, nuclear tests in the Pacific, when you know you had actually global effects somehow could be measured of uh, of, of uh, these single human um, events. Some would say that it started with the industrial revolution, you know, the the the, the steam engine, uh, early nineteenth century. Um, I, I'm inclined to support the view that we it would make sense to say that increasingly after the Second World War. But I, 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 I don't need a starting point. I mean, when, when it started, only how? And it started through the, uh, through the spread of uh, 
a certain way of dealing with nature, which became um, global. I mean, it was hegemonic for a long time, and then suddenly it became almost universal. Well, not suddenly, but gradually, almost universal. And this happened after 1945, where we've seen the growth in anything from international travel to international NGOs, organizations, the growth of the UN system, uh, the idea that every child should go to school and become literate. All of this was very new. Uh, and, it, um, and it led to a cultural, uh, I would say a cultural homogenization to some extent, and, uh, and it had uh, effects on the environment. So uh, I would say, for a reasonable starting point, 1945, the post-war era. All right, thank you. Um, you also mentioned that Anthropocene is kind of a uh, recent term, and, and we, we just started, you know, being self-aware of, of, of this era uh, quite recently. So. Uh, I, I suppose the it's kind of umbrella term that is trying to push some some social change within mm -hmm. the way we we behave as as individuals and as human humanity as well. Uh, would you say that there is some some progress, or are there some some changes some changes happening uh, as more and more work on on Anthropocene or, or is, is done as, as more and more scientists are, are pointing towards this? Well, um, it's, yeah, I mean, if you really want, it's easy to find positive uh, signs. But, you know, they are frequently very localized. I mean, the positive signs, for example, be biocultural diversity, uh, which is in, in, in many places sort of being rekindled. Uh, being strengthened, uh, getting support, uh, etc. Uh, yes, but the big picture is that uh, there isn't much by way of change. We've spoken about climate change now for more than 30 years and very little has happened in effect. So, uh, and some would say that what we need is a total change of mentality. Uh, you know, that, that is a view which is also held by many scientists because there is a gap between what the scientists say and what the politicians do, and even what the, the people who vote for the politicians want. Uh, so this is, this, is a big, this is a big question, and it's to do with the kind of temporality in which you live. Uh, when, when is your future? Is it next week? Is it sort of when you have to pay the next, uh, your next bill? Or is it when your grandchildren are going to you know, uh, retire? Um, these are very big questions, and there are, and there are many people you know, trying to answer them and trying also to shift our attention to look at ourselves and the surroundings in a different light. I mean, let me just mention one, one very recent book, which is also pretty nice, by a non-anthropologist, non non-archaeologist, he's a philosopher in Oxford, called Roman Kirznarik. So he's Australian, but of probably Croatian origin, I guess, works in Oxford, and wrote a book called The Good Ancestor where he asked the question, how can we behave in order to be considered good ancestors? Great question, isn't it? Uh, which is being raised far too rarely. And perhaps we would have acted differently had we had this question at the back of our minds. How can I be a good ancestor? So um, positive signs. Well, um, let's not give up hope. There are many options, many alternatives. And suddenly you reach a tipping point. And then you look back at the kind of uh, overconsuming, uh, destructive culture in which you and I live now. And you think, why didn't we change much earlier? It was so easy and it was so satisfying, but we didn't because of half dependence, because of fear, because of many things. So it's, it's very hard to tell, but we're in the middle of something here at, uh, and now at the moment. Uh, which is very, I mean, I said for an academic, very, I think for me, people like me, very exciting and frightening. All right, thank you. Um, Gary is uh, asking a question in the chat. Uh, in your opinion, what does the future look like, assuming the need for speed and consumption will continue to accelerate? Uh, yeah. Will there be a catastrophic change or extinction event or a gradual decline? Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's another great question. I wish, I wish I knew the answer. 
Um, no, I don't, th I don't think there will be a sort of a crash. I mean, things will happen much more gradually. There's not going to be a before and after. I mean, we, we sometimes get that impression from climate activists uh, that we need to act and we need to do it now. And in 10 years, it's going to be too late because then the earth will be uninhabitable. It, this is not the way it works. But what, the, what is a fact is that Anthropocene effects serve as a kind of magnifying glass and accelerators in the sense that they, they strengthen existing inequalities. Some people continue to reap the benefits, others have to pay the bill. People in Bangladesh pay the bill. Uh, people in Norway don't have to worry because their climate is, is, is perfectly okay and it's not going to, uh, to change seriously. So, and I don't think there will be a major extinction event, but we are living through a slow extinction event now. Uh, at the moment, uh, since 1970, we've killed off something like 68% of all vertebrates, 68%. And presently, 4% of mammalian biomass in the world is wild, wild animals, 4%. 36% human, and the remaining 60% are our livestock, mainly pigs and cattle. So uh, clearly, we are, we're transforming the face of the earth. In, in a, at, a, at a very fast speed, but there will not be a not be a big bang. It will, will not be like the, anything like the you know the chicks club impact of the big meteor which struck the Yucatan Peninsula 66 million years ago. It's not going to happen like that, but it will happen slowly. But what is dangerous is that we are perhaps going through a period of shifting baselines, so that you get used to things changing. You get used to a situation where there are there are fewer songbirds, there are fewer insects. Uh, I mean, scientists in Germany suggest that as many as 75% of the insects are gone from certain national parks in Germany, 75%. And we haven't seen the effects yet, but we will. Uh, but we get used to perhaps a situation where there are no more mosquitoes anymore in Stellenbosch, which is comfortable because then I don't get mosquito bites. Um, and and uh, yeah, sh so the shifting based on that, we get used to a situation which is actually quite dismal eventually. That that is uh, that is a danger. So um, I I cannot tell you what the, uh, the thing is that there is no answer to the question what will the future look like because it's up to you and me. It's up to us, isn't it? Whether or not we are determined to become good ancestors. Thank you. Are there any questions in the room? Yeah, come and you can ask it. Yeah, I will. <laughs> Hello. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I I would want to ask you a question in relation to the extinction you know, to collapse which uh, you, you talked about at the beginning and then just now um there is and i've unfortunately forgot um by whom it's either aristotle or herodot who narrated that after babylon was captured uh, on the other side of the city you didn't know it for two years subsequently mm -hmm. two, yeah, sorry two days not two days that was a bit excessive and um and when when city states collapsed in, in ancient Mesopotamia, uh, there is now it's quite likely that most of the population didn't really recognize it even, or at least didn't have much effect on it. So the question I would ask is, if the uh, if not um, the, the the term collapse is a bit is sometimes misunderstood as a, as a total collapse of everything, whereas sometimes it's just a very thin coat that uh, totally collapses with. You know, Comparatively little change effect for other people. Sometimes even in a betterment of their situation, if suddenly the uh, the the temple elite is gone, you don't have to do corvée labor for them every uh, every spring anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great comment. Uh, yeah, well, let's think about that. What 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 does the term collapse really entail? Well, I mean, if you take the ancient empires, you take Mesopotamia or even the Roman Empire or the Mayans. For many of the people who were subject peoples in those empires, it may have been a relief that these empires disappeared. Suddenly, there were no one who sent them out to fight meaningless wars, who came to collect taxes. So you got more freedom, less security, right? So there's, there may, may have been a trade of them. More bandits, but also no taxes, perhaps. Um, so, but, but to many, it, it, it may have been a source of some relief, but that, 
that really is contingent on what kind of economy you've got. If you have an economy where you where you can produce what you need uh, nearby uh, and mainly on a small scale, or you can trade with you know people nearby and etc., et uh, then you'll be okay. But the situation today is that most of us we're so dependent on you know people in China. Uh, I'm I'm well, I'm here. I'm, I'm re really dependent on on the people at ESCOM, you know, the, the South African electricity company, that they're doing the job so that the power just just suddenly doesn't go off, because I'd, I'd be in, in in serious trouble if it did. So we re we depend on so many. We we so much tied together and dependent on each other, which is also something we were reminded of during the pandemic, how vulnerable we are because of this global interconnectedness. So I think uh, um, were the global economy and the state system to collapse now, um, it would have been very difficult for most of us to cope. Some would, but not you and me, <laughs> certainly not me. But you're, but you're right, what is collapse? And uh, maybe we should have a more nuanced vocabulary for talking about this. Transformation, change, um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Anyway, um, maybe we should begin to call it a day. Uh, my long-suffering wife, <laughs> Valentine's Day. Yeah, uh, I, I don't think there are any more questions. Uh, there are only two comments from uh, uh, Harry and Monty who are joining us online. Uh, they would like to thank you uh, specifically for small pl places, large issues. Uh, oh. because they use uh, quotes from, from your book uh, quite frequently in their essays and, and you really help them to uh, get through one of their modules. Uh, but, you know, but, but you know, I'll tell you something about small places, large issues, because, because it's, it's a book that I've written sort of many times, because there's a Norwegian edition and an English edition. And the fourth English edition came out in 2014. Now I had to revise the Norwegian one because he was 10 years old. And I realized that if this book is going to survive for another decade, I have to do something. And what did I have to do? Well, there were two sort of major things I had to introduce. One of them, digital anthropology, uh, which, is, which is now sort of integrated in the text because it's everywhere. People are on Facebook, they have smartphones, and it's an important part of their lives. But the other is uh, climate and then the environment, which was almost absent you know, in the, in the previous edition. So I had to rewrite the chapters on nature and add one on climate anthropology, which also says something about the changes. Uh, and you know, a, a friend of mine, uh, who's, a, who's a novelist, wrote a, a, be a best-selling novel in the 1990s called Sophie's World, which is a novel about the history of philosophy. It's actually quite a clever book. Uh, novel for adolescents and adults about the history of philosophy. And as he said, you know, there was nothing there about ecology or the environment or nature. And today it would have been unthinkable for him to write a book about the history of philosophy without including that. So there has been a change in the way we think, which could also be a promising thing in the, in the long term, that we are aware in a way that we weren't about the fact that uh, life is fragile. The world is a, um, a vulnerable place and we need to look after it uh, better than we have so far. Yeah, as you said, it nicely mirrors what you've been talking about today during the during the talk, the, the change you have today involved in the new yeah. edition. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Thomas, for, for this talk. Thank you for uh, giving it online instead of uh, sending the recording. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. very enjoyable to, to, to have you yeah. uh, here tonight. And hopefully uh, your whole research in Stellenbosch will, will go well. And to the rest of people in our audience, uh, I hope we will see each other in two weeks for our uh, last talk of the term. So yeah, have a, have a good rest of the day. A nice evening. Yeah. Cheers, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. bye.